<clears throat> My topic for this next lecture is really the role of women during the Renaissance. And to discuss this from a, I think, a more fair point of view, I think that in the Renaissance and even today, women are still marginalized and um, they're not treated as fairly and they're not given as much power in the world. And uh, because often men control a lot of the economic power and control the major methods of communication. And, uh, you know, men try to preserve that for themselves and whether they do it consciously or subconsciously is open to debate. But basically it's really expressed, I think, a lot in the artwork from the Renaissance. I'm going to use the paintings to discuss this as a thesis and do a little compare and contrast. And in my own class, what we do is we read Baldessari Castiglione's text, The Courtier, which discusses an ideal man. And we read some excerpts from a, a wonderful author named Christine de Pizan from that time period who also discusses the roles of a woman and, uh, and how she does it. And so you might want to take a look at those and pick them up yourself. Now, these two works by Leonardo really kind of express a lot of the ideas that I think are behind what Renaissance courtier and Renaissance men thought about the world. For instance, on the left-hand side, it's a, it's a reference to Vitruvius, uh, that architect from the first century BCE who wrote his treatise on architecture that describes that uh, buildings need to be based on the proportions of the human body and he actually says man is the measure of all things and we even have that in the bible in some places and in platonic thought on the right hand side we have a theological and um, renaissance perspective and we've got all the standard uh, sort of uses of atmospheric perspective from the foreground to the middle ground to the background it lightens up and becomes grayer and bluer and greener and uh, we also have this sort of stable triangle in which we have Saint Anne with Mary on her lap and then uh, we have uh, her flowing down to uh, to basically um, Jesus and then Jesus' role as the Good Shepherd. And it's this weird collage. It almost looks photoshopped together because uh, if you really look at it closely, you'll see that Mary is seated on St. Anne's lap in a really kind of bizarre way. Now, what I'm suggesting is the nude male body, as evidenced by the Vitruvian man on the left-hand side, is a beautiful ideal figure for, for Leonardo. It shows power, it's mathematical, it's logical. And in the representation on the right-hand side, we've got representations of women. And basically, to put it a little bluntly, they're baby-making machines. And that the main role of a woman, according to Catholic thought at this point in time, is to become a good mother and to become the throne of wisdom, to pass wisdom down, and to make sure that men are raised correctly the way Mary raised Jesus, and to make a better world by being a good mother. And their role in the world is not to go out into the world and do things and build things. Now, just to support my thesis on this, I wanted to compare two pieces that you've looked at quite a lot before, Giotto against Jan van Eyck. Um, and uh, if you look at Jan van Eyck's, the Arnolfini portrait, basically, although we're a little hazy, remember we studied this and we weren't sure if Panofsky's interpretation of the Arnolfini wedding portrait made uh, perfect sense, we do see that the man is dressed sort of in exterior clothing, with that hat on, he is actually the one who is uh, near the window. He seems to be, uh, her hand is in his hand, and it's a wedding portrait. Now, it could be a sarcastic statement, as Craig Harbison says, but basically it shows men are the ones who go out, women are basically looking pregnant and in the house. And notice that she's closer to the bed. We have the same thing in Giotto's Madonna and Throne. She's the throne of wisdom, uh, and Jesus is seated on her lap. and she's sort of a piece of furniture when you think about it you know when they literally refer to her as the throne of wisdom she is a chair on which jesus sits and he he receives instruction from her and even though that may be a complimentary kind of idea if you look at it from a christian or catholic point of view it still relegates her to the position of a mother who's raising children Other depictions of women, and we look at this from uh, Albrecht Durer's point of view and, and 
also from a Catholic or, or a Christian point of view, although Durer later on converts because he's, he's great friends with Martin Luther, um, is this point of view that women are the source of original sin if you think about the story of Adam and Eve. Women, um, Eve basically brought Adam the apple and, and she's responsible for us being tossed out of the Garden of Eden uh, and, uh, and Adam was almost uh, an unwilling dupe to her feminine charms in some way. And so when we see depictions of women, if even if they're nude and there's a, a classical reason why it's okay to depict a, a nude female form, it still is the idea that she is the source of our downfall of original sin. This theme is actually taken up in sort of the, I guess you'd call these the, the popular print arts of the day. It's almost like these um, images were more popular because they're on paper, they're cheaper, they're proliferated, almost like magazines or posters. And so this guy, Hans Baldung Green, uh, depicts this story, and I thought it was very interesting when I came across these, the story of Aristotle and Phyllis. And it's kind of a, a weird, almost humorous, almost creepy um, story. But basically, remember Aristotle was the tutor for Alexander the Great. And he's the guy who we study as being one of the great logicians of the day. And he's one of the first people to have real universal knowledge of the world, or maybe even the last person to have that. Meaning that he knew a lot about a whole bunch of different things, and he would be a real model for the Renaissance. <clears throat> well... Aristotle uh, and uh, is Alexander the Great's uh, tutor, and Phyllis is Alexander's wife, and she says all men are equal because basically they're all dogs. They're all just uh, you know willing to uh, to give into lust, and uh, what, what we really have here is a uh, a classic Apollonian Dionysian conflict. The um, the Dionysian being the passionate and sexual, the Apollonian being the logic centers of the brain. And what she does is she creates a contest with, with Alexander, basically saying, hey, um, I'm going to show you even your great teacher can be brought to his knees by passion and that all men are sort of uh, equal when it comes to sexuality. Now, what it's doing is it's portraying women as seductresses in the story, and it's a cautionary tale to men that uh, don't let your bottom half run away with you, sort of centaur style. <clears throat> and the story starts basically like this. She says, um, you know, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you I know Aristotle's hot for me, and I'm going to bring him to his knees, literally, in a way. And so what I want you to do is I want you to hide, and I'm going to send... Aristotle a letter that says, uh, you can have me if you come to this courtyard and we're, we'll be alone, and you can keep an eye out on the balcony. Alexandra can keep an eye out and watch us, and I'll show you that I'm going to make him look foolish. So he comes, and, and she, uh, she starts sort of being seductive, I suppose, and, and being sexy, <laughs> and uh, uh, when it gets to be to the point where he is aroused beyond his own sort of rational control, she says, well, you can have me if you strip naked and let me ride you around the courtyard like, uh, like an animal. And that's what she does. So think about that. That's actually kind of um, showing you that even the great philosopher Aristotle uh, is a slave to his own passion and that uh, you need to somehow uh, harness that and control it. And it also casts the role of women in sort of a negative light if they are sexual because they lead to our humiliation in a way. Albert Durer and um, Green also bring this kind of theme up in, in various stories, especially in printmaking. And um, this print on the right-hand side called the Bewitched Groom, it's a groom who grooms horses, not uh, basically someone who's getting married. That always confused me when I first saw it. I, I actually had to think it through, so I just thought I'd mention it. What you have here is actually an image of a witch who is leaning across the window, who is casting a spell on this guy, and who is actually um, making the the horse kick him in the head and leading to his ruin. So uh, one of the things that women are 
uh, if they are not good wives like Mary or Anne, they are witches. And on the left-hand scene, we see um, either a scene, The Judgment of Paris, which is basically a, a sort of similar story where Helen of Troy, who's so beautiful that um, there are a thousand ships launched uh, in a battle over her, and basically she is responsible for the whole Trojan War. Uh, think about that. That's almost like a an Adam and Eve kind of thing. Or it could just be for witches. In any event, my point in showing you these, these images is that we are seeing these nude female forms that for Durer would have been desirable, and they are actually a source of evil, that the desire that a man has for a female is evil and can lead to his demise. And that's also in The Bewitched Groom. Now, another kind of idea that I think is really very interesting to me is that when um, women are single in the Renaissance culture, they don't have a lot of options in terms of career choices. So for instance, you can get to a nunnery, you can become a nun uh, and, and join the church if you don't want to get married. Uh, you can get married. Your other option, which we'll discuss in a little bit, would be a courtesan, uh, which can be sort of like a, a prostitute or a call girl of the day, and you could also be a prostitute. And then one of the roles that older women might have, and now think about this from, from a sort of point of view of the, uh, um, the Renaissance man. There's an older woman who uh, basically is either a widow or is uh, somehow seems to have power over the community. And often older people also are, are versed in herbal medicine and can be uh, um, a competition for a doctor of the day because neither one of them really knew what they were doing. I mean, a major uh, way of healing people was to bleed them. And a lot of uh, folk medicine was about herbology, and, and that actually probably seems to have worked a little bit better. But basically, the role that an older woman would have, or at least be claimed to have, is being a witch. Because, you know, these men don't want to honor an older woman and her point of view. Now, in the Bible, in the Apocrypha, uh, there are a couple of different stories. And actually, uh, outside of the Apocrypha, there's also the story of Salome, which is similar in nature. And uh, women in the Bible are often depicted as being uh, auxiliary or secondary to men in their roles. And in the story of Judith, which we're going to study much more when we move into the Baroque era, the story is basically a story of a female who is a Jewish um, heroine. And what happens is her town is attacked by this general named Holofernes. And apparently it's, it's a choiceless choice. If you, uh, if you read the Bible passage, the town was going to be destroyed no matter what happened or they were going to try to. King Nebuchadnezzar sends Holofernes to besiege this Jewish city. And Judith says, you need to put your faith in God. And the town elders are like, no, no, no. Um, we should just surrender. And she's like, no, God will deliver us. So she's putting her faith completely in God, and that makes her a heroine. And what she does is she basically goes outside of the gates of the town uh, and uh, has a meeting with Holofernes in which he is getting drunk and he's going to seduce her uh, and rape her probably. And uh, he sends all of his boys out of the tent, but she goes in there and she's, I guess, pouring her drinks in the potted palm in the corner of the tent. And when he passes out, she cuts off his head and puts it on the gates of the town. Now, if you think about that, that's a symbol of his passion. And even the head is a sort of metaphor or a cognate or a symbol of male genital um male genitals, more or less. And so when she chops off his head, she's kind of castrating him. She puts it on the gates of the town, and the, and the Persian army is literally castrated uh, because they've lost their uh, their general, and uh, they flee. They, they leave. And so she is a heroine, but if you think about all the times this story is going to be depicted in the future, you're going to see that basically 
you might, if you are male, have some sympathy for Holofernes because he gave into his, his lustful passion for this young, beautiful woman, Judith, and it led to his demise. And so these are, even though it's saying, put your faith in God is, is ostensibly the first message, there's also kind of a subtext there that the, the lust for a woman can lead to your downfall or your demise. So those are some of the roles that women can have. Now, one of the uh, other roles that a woman can have is to be basically the girlfriend or mistress or courtesan of a powerful man or not so powerful man. She can become a street prostitute, and that was very prevalent at that point in time. And this painting is kind of interesting because it's when you look at it, you're taught in most art history classes that this is supposed to be the Venus. It's, a, it's an allegorical portrait of love and Venus presiding over a marriage. And in the background of this image is a woman going into what's called a cassone, which is a wedding chest. And uh, they're putting together her dowry and Venus, the goddess of love, is presiding over this event. And you see this wonderful perspective in the floor, in the tiles of the floor, and you actually see atmospheric perspective. And you have this classical, beautiful form of the female form on the bed. And uh, maybe the, uh, the cherries that she has is a symbol of uh, fecundity or fertility. And uh, so uh, this is sort of dressed up. It's sort of an emperor's new clothes. It's disguised saying, yeah, this is a really classy picture. But I remember when I was a kid uh, on Saturday Night Live, there was a skit in which basically they were making fun of this painting and they said basically it's a, a really nice picture of a naked broad on a couch. And I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting because is it? You know, I mean, what does the little dog mean? Is the dog a symbol of faith, like supposedly, or fidelity, like in the in the Arnold Feeding wedding portrait? So, of course, you know, I had to look it up. And so when I studied it a little bit more in depth, what I actually found out was the, um, this is the girlfriend, I think, of the Duke of Gonzaga or Mantua. Um, and uh, basically, this is a painting of this guy's naked girlfriend for his own private pleasure he would have been looking at this thing. And we have over the centuries sort of uh, idealized it and turned it into something that it's not, which is literally a Venus, but it's not. It's a picture of this guy's naked girlfriend using classical sort of themes to dress it up and make it a cool painting to make it okay to depict the nude female form. And that is gonna be something that's taken up later on, especially in this class where we're gonna discuss sort of uh, using classicism as a, as a disguise for eroticism, for the depiction of something erotic. Now there's a couple of really great scholars who are feminist art historians and scholars, Jermaine Greer and Linda Nochlin, and Lyndon Auckland wrote an article, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And her thesis basically is there were no great women artists because they were denied access to schools that would teach them how to paint really well. And so they couldn't draw from the nude male form. They weren't given access to all the artistic equipment and, and training that they could have. And... Uh, if they were taught how to paint and draw, it was to basically endow them with a sort of dowry to make them uh, improved. Sort of the, uh, the stereotype of the 1950s woman or 1930s woman who goes to college to catch a man. So education is to make her more valuable as a wife and a partner rather than to make her someone who could see her way through the world. Well, it's kind of interesting because Sofanisba Anguissola is a great Renaissance painter. And she you can see that she has atmospheric perspective. That chessboard has really cool uh, perspective on it. She has got these gestures, these humanistic gestures. Um, and uh, it's a self-portrait. She's showing herself as extremely pretty. She's got all the textures down. She's showing you she can paint nature. And um, in the right-hand corner, you even have her governess. And uh, she is playing a game with her little sisters. Now, it's kind of interesting because one of the ideas that we have really been discussing is something called the male gaze. 
And the male gaze is basically an art historical term. It's a buzzword, which basically you can use when you're studying literature and fiction and things like that, which describe that there's a point of view from a male or men's point of view that is laid over every single work of art, probably up until more or less the 20th century. And that art is manufactured for a male audience. And I want to posit that Sophonisba Anguissola is depicting herself as a nice girl. She's a nice woman here. She has a high neckline. She's showing that she can entertain you. She's playing a chess game. She's also showing you that she can take the role of a good woman because she has she is basically sort of being motherly to her her uh, her sisters. And if you were worried that she was promiscuous, she always has her governess about her protecting her. So I think that's kind of a, a way that she's being depicted here is definitely for a male audience. Now, her biography is a little bit more complex, a little bit more interesting, and I won't go too much into depth in a short video on it. But basically, she was trained as a painter because her father was an artist and her father didn't have a lot of money. And so he trained her to be a really good artist. And when he died, she was left holding the bag and she had to take care of her family. So she takes care of her little sisters and she is offered wonderfully enough so that she can support her, her family, a commission to come and paint for the queen of Spain. So she goes to the Spanish court and becomes a, a court painter. And uh, there's actually a recent biography about this. But basically, the, the lines of the story of her life are she goes to the Spanish court. She is supported by the king and the queen there. She's actually a confidant of, of the queen and, uh, and the painter to the queen, who's actually a, a very young girl. I think she was 14 or 15 at the time. So it would make sense that Sofonispa would be bonding with her because she was pretty young, too. And... She is someone who they then decide that they need to marry her off. And so they're going to marry her off to a Sicilian. And uh, the Italians didn't think that the Sicilians were that groovy at that point in time. So she says, well, let me go back home to Cremona one more time. And according to one of the sources, a book by Germaine Greer that I read called The Obstacle Race, basically, while she was on her way home, she met this sea captain and she fell in love and she ended up marrying him. And then she stopped painting. And to me, the idea that she stopped painting was really significant, that she was a painter for the purposes of basically supporting her family and also catching a man. And when she did that, she didn't need it anymore. And so in essence, I'm kind of suggesting that women were uh, participants in the male point of view and the male gaze, and that they were sort of brainwashed the way we brainwash people today through the media. Now, the last thing I want to point out about this painting is that it's a self-portrait, but she's not painting herself. And if you think about most self-portraits that we will see in the future, very often people paint themselves in self-portraits, that they show themselves in front of an easel. Here are a grouping of some of her other paintings. And uh, if you notice that in none of these, she's actually painting. She's playing musical instruments. The governess, who was a good friend of hers, uh, is chaperoning her in the background. And when she paints her family, it's really a way of showing how uh, significant uh, they are to her and showing her in a way of being a good mother, being a, a sort of good older sister. Now, the icon of the dog that we saw in Titian's painting and we also see in this painting uh, According to Panofsky is an icon of fidelity. I actually read in one place that small dogs were kind of an entertaining thing for rich people in the court. And they also thought that having a dog would actually draw the fleas off of you to the dog so that you would be more comfortable. And so having a dog is, is, is a way of actually protecting yourself against some bad stuff.